what next for open government in the Eastern Partnership countries? Uh, my name is Jeff Lovett. I'm a member of the International Experts Panel of the Open Government Partnership, in particular the OGP's independent reporting mechanism. Uh, this uh, webinar is being hosted by the OGP, the independent reporting mechanism in partnership with the OGP's support unit. I just stress the independent reporting mechanism works to assess the design and implementation of OGP action plans and the respective commitments of the member countries. Before we begin, uh, I'll just stress the rules of engagement. First, the webinar is being recorded and may be shared on social media. Given that there may be, we certainly hope many of us on the call today, we ask that you follow our guidance and make use of the chat function to share your comments, uh, ideas, experience, and of course, to ask questions. Please introduce yourselves in the chat. We will have a couple of polls uh, during the webinar, which uh, we encourage you to engage with. By default, uh, attendees are on mute to ensure a smooth webinar without background interference, distractions. Uh, the organizers will unmute individuals as we bring you into the discussion. So in introduction, uh, the context uh, in the framework of the OGP is that the four Eastern Partnership countries that are currently active members of the OGP, which is Armenia, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, are this year in the process of co-creating new OGP action plans. So there's scope for sharing lessons and challenges, and even for embarking perhaps on regional cooperation among the countries. Uh, Azerbaijan is currently suspended, but is implementing its action plan under special conditions. I think it's also useful perhaps for many of you to know that there is a local call uh, out for local uh, members of the OGP, which could be municipalities, uh, regions, oblasts, um, as they are called in, still in Ukraine and other countries. The deadline for that is 17th of July, and perhaps during the call we can share that on the, on the chat, the link to that. Um, so the webinar will provide an opportunity for stakeholders working in the Eastern Partnership region to get a better understanding of where open government reforms have gained traction, where challenges persist, how ongoing support through, for instance, the EU's Eastern Partnership Policy Framework can be best utilized, and the role that can be played by different stakeholders in advancing open government reforms. So the, the challenges, I think we all know, some of them, rule of law, independent judiciary and prosecution services, conflicts of interests, media ownership, of course, untangling money and politics, which is a challenge in all of the countries, and civic space. These remain that, of course, there has been progress, I would say, in perhaps free and fair elections, but it's not, uh, it's not a linear trajectory. There are ups and downs, setbacks, but we've seen progress also on transparency and procurement, on anti-corruption courts, courts, so to name just a few. This year, of course, with COVID-19, uh, we've seen additional concerns, shrinking budgets, uh, use of emergency laws, and rushed legislative procedures pros and cons handled differently by different countries. This webinar, we hope, can bring uh, some of the ideas from you, from the participants, and we will open with a presentation from DG Nia, followed by a presentation on comparative results from the four countries, and then perspectives from experts and stakeholders working at the regional and national level. Uh, today's discussion, we hope, will provide valuable input for informing OGP's work in the region in the coming years, as OGP looks to partner with the European Commission, with DG Near, and also the OECD, the Anti-Corruption Network, on the program which is planned called the EU for Integrity Action for the Eastern Partnership. Uh, and that has an explicit focus on supporting reforms in anti-corruption, justice, and public services, and helping building alliances between reformers across the region. Uh, the idea really is to have peer learning, to develop perhaps regional standards on issues such as beneficial ownership and procurement tra transparency or other areas, and really to, to deepen the o OGP's engagement and of course the country's own ownership of the OGP process. I think it's worth mentioning that we had um, the Eastern Partnership Summit only last week, which in the end, because of COVID-19 took place via video, 
but before that, on 11th of May, the EU Council approved the conclusions on Eastern Partnership Policy beyond 2020. Uh, the Council encouraged Eastern Partnership countries, uh, I quote, to increase efforts for additional progress in all fields, including outstanding challenges on justice and anti-corruption, as well as on gender equality, the enabling environment for civil society and non-discrimination, as well as freedom of association, assembly, speech, and on hate speech. So I think it's pretty clear uh, that the EU is very focused on open government relevant issues and the council called on the European Commission and the External Action Service, the EU's diplomatic corps, to better monitor, working closely with the member states, the rule of law, strengthening the rule of law in the Eastern Partnership countries, which I think, again, shows a strong signal that uh, the rule of law, anti-corruption issues, open government are going to remain a very core cool part of the European Union's focus on the countries. Uh, what I'm going to do now, uh, we're actually ahead of time, which I think is great. Um, so I hope our first speaker is ready. We have uh, our speakers now on a slide in front of you. So rather than go through them all, uh, as you see, we'll start with DG Near. Um, and I would ask uh, Mathieu Bosquet, head of unit at DG Near, full name De Directorate General for Neighbourhood and Enlargement Negotiations, uh, if you're ready uh, to take the floor, that would be great. Mathieu. Absolutely, and thank you very much. Thank you, Please. Jeff. Thank you to, to OGP for inviting us. So I'm Mathieu Bousquet, indeed. I mean, the head of unit in charge of governance programs at regional level for Eastern Partnership. So you just said it. I mean, it's uh, it's very clear. Um, the uh, We had the leaders video conference. It was not a summit because it was not physical, but we had the leaders video conference. You added also of course, the communication of uh, uh, the Commission and the uh, HIVP on the 18th of March about the future of Eastern Partnership with resilience as an overall framework, but clearly highlighting the role of civil society in uh, the rule of law uh, um, in, uh, in the region. We had the Council conclusion and we also had the Parliament uh, who had a, a statement on the 18th uh, of uh, June uh, supporting very much, I mean, this long-term policy objectives for uh, the uh, Eastern Partnership. So we will continue uh, building on the achievements of the 20 deliverables for 2020 and pursue further progress on those areas that require more efforts. Um, namely, rule of law and anti-corruption reforms. I mean, you all know the situation in the in the countries in the region. So we want to continue our efforts together with partner countries and with civil society to improve uh, uh, that. In, in view of this work, we really need a strong engagement of civil society organizations to help really shaping a corruption-free uh, environment in Eastern Partnership uh, uh, countries. So together with you, uh, civil society, with OGP, with uh, uh, the Eastern Partnership National Authorities and also our institutional partners. And I'm very pleased also to have uh, here uh, uh, OECD, I mean, with whom we will partner as well, the Anti-Corruption Network, but also the Council of Europe, for example. We will bring our efforts one step further uh, to implement open government reforms in the areas of anti-corruption, justice and public administration and CSOs have a key role to play in this regard. So you just mentioned the issue of metrics, measurements. This is key. I mean, if we want to be in a position to discuss and to see progress, I mean, we need to measure. So measurement is key. So we have introduced a new scorecard system to benchmark, monitor, and evaluate uh, the results of the rule of law reform efforts in Eastern Partnership country. So we are defining key performance indicators for better measurement, and we want them to be based on evidence, not on rumors. So for that, we have developed this new program, the EU for Integrity Regional Program uh, for Eastern Partnership countries. Um, we will have a, a contract with OECD, Huzudan will talk about it certainly, uh, where we are going to measure anti-corruption performance indicator. This will feed in the regional analysis, but also be used as a pressure tool in our policy dialogue with uh, partner countries, but also in your analysis, I mean, civil society organizations about how the situation should move and in the direction in which it should move. 
So we are very happy, I mean, to count on uh, uh, OGP as an implementing partner, also to really to enhance civic and civic uh, uh, society participation and engagement in Eastern Partnership region. Uh, for more inclusive and responsive governments, also with uh, one of the key words for us, which is really citizen-centered uh, service delivery. So this will be the first time that we have a, a structured and targeted support to CSO in the rule of law at regional level. So the OGP's expertise and also the multiplier effect through its solid uh, network will allow us, I mean, to leverage on its platform to design and implement anti-corruption reforms. So we are about to finalize the process of signing a contract with OGP, uh, which is about 2.5 million euros for the implementation of our joint action. This will really enable the voice of the CSOs to resonate louder and be heard uh, by all parties to achieve progress in anti-corruption reforms. So I'm really certain that this will be a success story for the ultimate benefit of uh, Eastern Partnership citizens and also for building trust in the public institutions across the region. So you asked me to be very short. I think I was even shorter than the five minutes, but I, I really look forward to have uh, this discussion and to hear from you on the, how can the EU be of better help and support to promote anti-corruption and uh, uh, pro rule of law efforts in Eastern partnership countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's great. And uh, I think um, everybody will welcome uh, the initiative, the support of the EU working with OGP and OECD and, of course, measures of anti-corruption. Uh, there are plenty of them, but um, many of them need strengthening. There's a, a, a plenty of scope for more, and I think um, the OECD working with OGP and the EU will, will be an excellent opportunity. I'd like to, to move on to our, our next speaker, which is from, from the OGP's independent reporting mechanism, and it's uh, Tina Tin. Uh, Ninua, who will uh, try and look through some of the, the, the cross-country uh, uh, priorities, the, 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 the kind of connections across the Eastern Partnership countries in terms of the type of commitments and the type of challenges faced. Tinatine, are you with us? Are you able to join? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Um, welcome, Great. everyone. Uh, nice to see a lot of familiar um, names in the chat. Um, as Jeff has already said, um, just for those of you who might not know, the independent reporting mechanism is the accountability arm of the um, OGP, and we assess performance of participating countries by looking at the commitments and analyzing early results. So what I will present today is based on um, various IRM reports, including the recent ones, uh, the four recent report for, reports for the Eastern Partnership countries. Um, as Jeff has already mentioned, uh, in the beginning of his presentation, um, out of six Eastern Partnership countries, five are members of OGP. They have joined the partnership in 2011. Um, with the except, exception of Azerbaijan, all uh, four are actively participating. And we have seen 19 action plans um, uh, from the uh, five members, uh, including 357 commitments. Next. In terms of um, performance of commitments, uh, Eastern Partnership countries uh, do similar to other countries, uh, to the countries in the EU and global average, but show slightly lower percentages when it comes to the ambition of commitments and uh, early results. Next. Out of the 19 action plans that we have seen uh, from the five countries, there are some common trends uh, that we'll be covering today, uh, particularly in two areas. One is anti-corruption, um, which is a, a very popular topic amongst Eastern Partnership countries. Uh, the word corruption or anti-corruption appears in at least 17 out of 19 action plans. And um, another one is public services um, that covers um, digitization of services and also disclosure of information in various sectors. Next. Procurement and public contracting is an area which saw um, a big pickup in action plans starting from 2016. 
four Eastern Partnership countries have made commitments in this area, and two of them have shown uh, strong results already. Uh, Moldova and Ukraine um, have made strides to um, start publishing their procurement data in open contracting data standard and has set, set, set up the platforms. And particularly Ukraine um, has been an early champion of uh, procurement reforms. As many of you know, the Prozoro uh, platform, uh, which is a transparent um, procurement system and the Dozoro platform, which allows public feedback and flagging of violations during public procurement have been widely recognized. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you can see um, a snapshot from the Dozoro uh, platform, which was an OGP commitment. It allows citizens to submit um, reports on irregularities of public procurement and hundreds of thousands of individuals have already uh, used the platform, if not more. And um, many investigations have already started and some tenders have even been stopped as a result of these um, reports. Next. Uh, beneficial ownership transparency is another area which is relatively new in OGP and also Eastern Partnership countries. So far, three countries have made commitments, um, and most of them with uh, transformative potential. Uh, we have seen two particularly interesting commitments. Um, Armenia um, is currently setting up a publicly available beneficial ownership register to be piloted in the mining sector as part of its uh, commitment to the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. And Ukraine was also an early champion of uh, the Beneficial Ownership Register, which was first launched in 2015. And now um, the country is developing a verification mechanism. Next. Money in politics is another area where um, quite large number of commitments have been made. Uh, here we have seen uh, specific commitments on asset declarations of public officials, conflicts of interest, financing of political parties. Um, two examples that stand out with stronger results include Ukraine's uh, electronic declaration system, which has replaced the previously existing paper-based system. Um, this commitment um, and this project has um, gained a lot of um, publicity through media as it has revealed uh, a lot of news about wealth owned by Ukrainian public officials. And um, uh, the asset declaration system uh, for Georgia, on the next slide, I have a snapshot from um, the um, declarations uh, portal, uh, which is considered to be one of the best practice examples in terms of transparency, comprehensiveness, and scope of information. Um, as part of its OGP commitment, Georgia introduced a verification system which randomly chooses declarations um, and checks them for the accuracy. Of course, following up on the um, uh, inaccuracies is um, still remains a challenge, um, but that commitment has been um, has shown some good, uh, strong early results. Next. Um, public services is an area where all five countries have made commitments. We've seen around 70 commitments covering different areas such as transport, health, um, uh, infrastructure, education. Um, most commitments, though, in these areas are about um, digitization of services, e-government initiatives uh, aimed at setting up one-stop shops, um, and disclosure of information, mainly statistical information about different sectors. Where we have seen fewer commitments is um, public oversight mechanisms and feedbacks, um, the ways for feedback for citizens to rate public services and to provide their feedback about the quality of services they are receiving. Uh, in this case, we have seen uh, two examples from Ukraine and Moldova, which will be covered later by other speakers as well. Um, but this is definitely an area where improvements can be made. Next. Um, so in, in terms of um, the next steps, um, IREM has already made several recommendations um, on where countries need to do more work and where the priorities for reform lie. Mm -hmm. uh, given the um, situation with the coronavirus mm -hmm. pandemic and the challenges it poses for the governments in terms of the response and recovery efforts, some of these recommendations become even more important. Um, I would like to highlight particularly a uh, few, um, uh, starting with public procurement. IRM reports have made um, a lot of recommendations with more detailed steps in terms of what 
countries need to do. We have recommended to um, introduce transparency measures for subcontracts, to continue publishing data in open data contracting data standard, and to improve the feedback and complaints mechanisms. Beneficial ownership transparency also becomes an important area to avoid conflict of interest in uh, bidding for government contracts, which are uh, many during um, these pandemic times. Um, and we have already seen good results here from um, the two countries. Um, so continuing um, uh, focusing on this in the next action plans would be a priority. Open budgets and fiscal transparency again receives a new impetus. We have recommended to publish budget allocations uh, and expenditures made for emergency response, particularly with um, uh, fiscal stimulus measures, and to continue publishing criteria for relief packages. Um, also, uh, last but not the least, um, just I will say very briefly, I know I have only one uh, minute left. Um, it would be good to also focus on introducing public feedback mechanisms and citizen engagement in uh, evaluation of public services. And there is also a good good opportunity to link up um, the next OGP action plans with other international commitments, with uh, EU association agreements, um, OECD, and international financial institutions. I'll stop here. Great. Now we were going to launch a poll now based on, I think, uh, the slide there. Which recommendations resonate most for your country? Is, is, is the poll already up? Can people see it? I think you can. Great. Okay. Um, so please engage uh, uh, which recommendations resonate most for you, for your country. Uh, also, please um, type questions in, into the chat. Uh, and after, after a while, we, oh, we've got very, a lot of answers already. Maybe we'll be able to end the poll quite quickly. But I'll give people a, a, a bit more, more time. And uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, which is Victor uh, Nestulia from the Open Contracting Partnership. And after that, we will give the results of the poll. Great, Victor, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to be here and speak about open contracting process uh, progress in Eastern Partnership region. So first of all, uh, open contracting is a transformation of public procurement to make it open, efficient, uh, and fair and deliver best value for money uh, goods, works, and services to citizens. Uh, it's quite a challenging reform because there are a lot of stakeholders involved and by reforming procurement, you're also touching financial management system, enforcement mechanism, control system, and so on. However, at the same time, there are some very simple steps that each particular government can do comparatively easy. And I'm talking about transparency here. Uh, in 1994, if you wanted to look at a picture of planet Pluto, you will get this. Basically, technologies were very poor. However, today, you will get this. Technologies evolved, and you know all the details about the planet. Uh, you can see it's 360 and understand, you know, all the minerals, everything basically what is, what is there. With public procurement, the situation is similar. Of course, 20 years ago, we had old-style papered system, uh, Procurement opportunities have been advertised in paper magazines. We were collecting paper, beads, etc. Today, we have digital world. And a lot of countries already have e-procurement systems. However, there is still a challenge because in most of the systems, situation with data is similar to this picture. Pretty messy, right? We at Open Contracting Partnership have developed an open contracting data standard. It is a publication schema which helps to structure the data along the contracting process starting from planning to implementation and actually publish it in a nice way. And having open contracting data standard in your system, you will be able to sort your data, you will be able to arrange it and present it nicely and visually. Good news, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia and Armenia already have OCDS. It's much more advanced in Moldova and Ukraine, still a lot of challenges and opportunities in Georgia and Armenia. However, it's good that governments understand its value and work on it. At the same time, we live in a very transparent in terms of procurement sphere world. Moldova and Ukraine, for example, have full access to data from procurement system. And even more, you can read through documents submitted by bidders, decisions by tender committees, and so, and so on and so forth. However, transparency is just the beginning. And of course, publishing of information doesn't solve all, all, all of your problems. And according to CPI, we read in a red region. 
right? We know that we have challenges with accountability and integrity and level of corruption in our countries are pretty high. Imagine uh, you introduce transparency in your procurement system. It's like shedding the light, you know, in the kitchen. And uh, if you had experienced it sometimes, uh, if there are cockroaches, you switch on the light, they are running away. However, if you do nothing, just sit there or leave the room, keeping the light on, they will, you know, calm down, get back and feel free there. They will be again masters of the kitchen. Same happens with procurement sphere, if you don't do anything with your data. And that's why it is very important to use open contracting approach and not only publish the data, but also use it, engage all possible stakeholders, starting from civil society, of course, journalists, academia, but also very important government, procuring entities and bidders who has to use this data to make data-driven policy decisions, to promote opportunities, to look for best opportunities for business and so on and so forth. The journey of open contracting in Eastern Partnership was pretty good. Actually, we've already heard about Ukraine and Moldova, uh, star commitments on Prozoro and Zoro, uh, good data, great infrastructure in Ukraine. However, very poor situation with control and enforcement. And I can say that it's overall problem for, for the region. In Moldova, M tender e-procurement system, again, full, full disclosure of data. Most probably it will be replaced by a new system because of different political situations. Uh, however, government still says that they will publish OCDS data. Again, as overall in the region, we have great situation with civil society organizations. And again, no infrastructure around data and pure institutional development. In Georgia, decent e-procurement system. 10 years ago, it was one of the best e-procurement systems worldwide. Strong civil society organizations like IDFI or Transparency International, some analytical, analytical tools and lack of institutional capacity. And here I don't mean like corruption, you know, to prevent corruption in the system, but also policy decision, promotion uh, of the opportunities among business, etc. In Armenia, again, old e-procurement system, RBEPS, some of the data is available, strong civil society. However, no monitoring infrastructure, no tools based on data. And again, lack of institutional capacity. What are the opportunities? As I said, we have to promote data use. We have to build stakeholders' capacity, starting from civil society and going to government control and enforcement, and train and how actually to live in the 21st century and actually use the data. In Ukraine, we also can focus on improving controlling and enforcement mechanism. In Moldova, we have to build monitoring infrastructure around great available data. In Georgia, in one minute, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm pinching. In Georgia, we can uh, focus on improving data publication. And finally, in Armenia, as government is now considering the reform of e procurement and uh, plans to revamp e procurement system, we can be very ambitious and uh, plan to develop an open by design system designed for citizens. Finally, we live in a very challenging situation of COVID. And in procurement world, we have we've seen a lot of problems with COVID procurements. However, all the challenges are always an opportunities. And then we saw, for example, in Moldova, uh, where there bad situation with transparency in healthcare procurement. Actually, citizens and government agreed and now publish information. So let's not waste the opportunity and use it to retain trust with government, citizens, and business. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Victor. Um, maybe I'll just, uh, I think we have the, the results of the, of the first poll, uh, fairly even, uh, slightly more for the first three uh, priority recommendations, public procurement reforms, beneficial ownership, transparency, and citizen feedship, feedback mechanisms, uh, but almost as much for linking action plans to international commitments and broader open government strategies. When we have the Q&A, we can perhaps explore uh, why people feel that there'd be more um, emphasis on, put on, on different choices there, or if there are other um, areas, priorities, which, which we should be focusing on. But now we shall go to our next uh, speaker, Jasmina Haynes from Integrity Action. We've heard a lot about uh, procurement uh, and uh, from uh, Integrity Action, I think we'll hear about uh, how, how we can improve citizens' engagement. So the floor is yours, Jasmina. Thank you very much, Jeff, and hello, everybody, and OGB, thank you very much for hosting us. There are multiple examples of super successful uh, mechanisms to support citizen feedback around the world, um, and I'm very happy that you have invited us to showcase ours. 
Um, I will start by building a case for citizen engagement in public services. Um, I know that I don't need, need to convince you about the necessity and importance of it, but what I would also like to showcase is that it's not just citizens' democratic right, but by doing it, we are also bringing to the table an economic solution to efficiently and effectively delivering public services. Um, after that, I will move to talk about the project that we have implemented in Armenia together with our partner, Armavir Development Center. And I know Naira is also on this call, and I would suggest for any specific questions, especially on how to nitty gritties of local delivery, please also don't just reach out to us, but reach out to them as well. Um, when it comes to details of how to, I don't think I have enough time, and as I said, I, uh, please talk to us more, and I have also embedded a couple of links. Um, we're fully recognizing that COVID has created a very, um, has turned our worlds upside down, not only that we are asking governments to talk about um, and put in place mechanisms for more increased, more, um, more profound ways of bringing transparency into public sector and to encourage public participation. Also, we're asking them to fight the corruption and to really make sure that all the public services are very citizen-centered, while at the same time, we know that there will be less money coming into into governmental budget and there will be many prior, competing priorities. And in this setup, I, I think this is, in, as dark the hour is, this is, we have to recognize this as also an opportunity to really make lasting changes in, when it comes to accountability and transparency. This COVID has created a space for us to bring solutions and bring mechanisms to involve citizens because they can take pressure off the government to employ people to understand what exactly is happening on the grassroots level. Citizens with highly vested interests, for example, that local school is open when they have a child of, of primary school age, will happily come forward as volunteers to say what is exactly happening. We also know that citizens, citizens have very localized knowledge about what can work. And if you open channels for hearing them out, they can come up with not only cost efficient solutions, but also the ones that will work over many years to come. And when solutions are created through a dialogue between government and citizens, we know that citizens will also uh, embrace the ownership over those solutions. And of course, like in any other human interactions, when the conversation is going in two ways, we feel and trust that we are being heard. And when we um, co-create solutions, we know that they build a relationship of trust. And trust is something that governments and citizens and all of us desperately need when we are facing the world that is so, so challenging. Um, and uh, also, this is an opportunity for civil society sector, for organizations like ADC in Armenia, for organizations like Integrity Action, many others who are on the call and others um, working in the space of accountability and transparency for us to really showcase the added value that we can bring to the table. We have many solutions that are well tried, well tested, we know what works, and let's bring it to the table. And I would say to governments, work with your civil society, reach out, we can make this, this journey a lot, lot easier. Um, may, next slide, please. Um, you know, of course, None of this is, is with, without, without challenges, but I'm not gonna focus on those too much. I feel that sometimes we get very stuck in conversations discussing why we shouldn't even embark on the journey of trying and testing different solutions. But instead, I'm gonna give you the example of uh, monitoring school reconstruction um, project in, in Armenia that was funded through loan of Asian Development Bank and more information you can find from the bottom, bottom link. And I think it really captures that imagination of what is possible when you even see citizens who 
are passionate to, to have the schools schools built. Uh, bi weekly based a last minute. construction. Sure. They took time to visit uh, um, the and they have identified problems, but you know, through through all of this, the problems got solved, and we have fully functioning schools now um, as, as a result. I'll leave it there. Please visit links and happy to talk more. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks very much. We did have a request from Rati to, uh, I'm not sure whether it was to, to, to speak. If Rati is there, maybe uh, the team can unmute Rati. Is that possible? In the meantime, we do have, I see, a question. We had a question for Mr. Buske, which I think was answered on COVID-19, but then we had another question um, from Christina Patak about, I'm curious to learn some innovative practices on the various topics we've discussed with regard to COVID-19 response, and to what extent our current approaches and actions will be changed in the post-COVID world order. Um, if anybody has any responses to that, we do have the, from Sandra in the chat, that was the OGP's guide on open response. Uh, would anybody like to respond to that? Or is Ratti able to talk? Have you been able to? Do we have Ratti? No? Please, just a minute. Hi, I, I'm here. If you are asking ah, me, but I great. joined a bit late. I joined a okay. bit late and I didn't hear what you were because I had problems with connection. Uh, but I never asked you know, for a question and sorry, uh, I will join you later because uh, I didn't hear okay. the previous conversation. No problem, no problem. Just me that you wanted to, to speak. Sure, so on the, on the topic of innovative solutions and specifically looking how they can help us respond to COVID, um, we have an example where through citizen monitoring that is technology facilitated and of course minimizes that face-to-face -face interaction, we can find out whether medication is being delivered to right people at the right time and are they being charged the cost as, as it is or are the prices getting inflated. Also through these direct communication with citizens, we we are opening channels about um, preventing the spread of mis misinformation. I think that citizen opening channels for citizens' feedback can have so many multiple effects and you can pretty much apply it on any conversation um, that is related, related to COVID from group of experts, independent experts who are acting as citizen um, monitors, from involving doctors and nurses to say whether they're receiving PPEs or not, from patients to school children say, to say whether um, distancing rules, for example, are put in place, do they have access to clean water and et cetera. Maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe Tinatin, you could uh, tell us whether COVID-19 has uh, resulted in significant delays in action plan preparation. What sort of feedback has come from from the governments from the point of contact, uh, and also the impact on um, if there's impact in terms of budgeting, if that's had any effect on OGP budgets. Or, yes. Yeah. So. Um, as you mentioned in the beginning, Jeff, um, four countries out of five are currently developing their action plans. It has resulted in some delays, obviously, because state of emergencies uh, were put in place in all countries and um, certain limitations were imposed on physical gatherings, etc. However, some countries have, uh, uh, like Ukraine, for example, um, have um, uh, moved successfully to online uh, deliberations, more or less. Um, but um, of course, um, we have experienced delays. So I think by the end of this year, instead of submitting the action plans in August, now uh, the submission is delayed towards the end of the year. Um, a lot of restrictions have been lifted in terms of uh, limitations on um, usual freedoms and rights, in terms of um, accessing information, which has been an issue as well. Um, but there have been, of course, some limitations in terms of consulting with the usual OGP stakeholders because the decisions had to be made quickly. And that's um, a challenge I believe my colleagues from Armenia and uh, Moldova are going to highlight later in their presentations.
unmuting myself. Um, that, that, that's great. If we don't have any more questions at the moment, oh, I think we do. Yes, we've got a, a request to focus on governance challenges revealed by COVID-19 and how they could be effectively addressed. We've kind of partly touched up. Is there a practice in any of the participant countries using OGP forums or similar mechanisms as consultative mechanisms on COVID-19 response. Would anybody like to pick up on that? Um, I certainly know there have been in, in other countries. Um, I know, for instance, Finland has had one, but uh, I'm not sure specifically the practice in the Eastern Partnership, whether the response, uh, certainly there's been issues over what would be the kind of uh, uh, Accelerated uh, legislative procedures has been an issue in some countries in terms of the state of emergency, whether the OGP forums have been in, included in consultative mechanisms. Maybe if people know about that, they can raise their hands or they can uh, even mention it later uh, in, in the chat. What we can do is um, I suggest that we move on to the next presentation, but please, people, if everybody could prepare some questions that you have and keep on using the chat as much as you possibly can. Now we will move on to Lusudan uh, Michalitsa from OECD's Anti-Corruption Network. Uh, we heard a bit more about that the, there will be partnership with the OECD, the EU and OGP uh, on a project funded by the EU later. Um, and uh, Lusudan, great, we've got your presentation up, please. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you for this invitation, which is uh, actually the beginning of a quite unique new partnership of three organizations. As mentioned in the beginning uh, by Matthew, um, EU for Integrity program, which will be soon launched, will promote integrity and anti-corruption reforms in the region, and we're happy to join forces here with the OGP, EU, and the OECD Anti-Corruption Network for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So in this time that I have, I would uh, briefly tell you about the ACN. Then I will highlight some trends uh, in the region that are relevant for the OGP work, as well as Eastern Partnership Policy Frameworks. And um, in the end, I'll talk about the future work, how we can work together uh, to promote um, anti-corruption reforms and uh, to create greater impact for the citizens of Eastern Partnership countries. So the next slide, please. Anti-corruption network for Eastern Europe and Central Asia is a regional initiative which was founded in 1998. So it has 20 plus years of experience of working in the region. It's a peer review program, which is a monitoring program uh, with um, a strong involvement of civil society uh, has already uh, been there for more than 16 years. Um, the law enforcement network of um, law enforcement practitioners that uh, fight corruption in the region have been gathering since 2010 under the law enforcement network um, framework, which is part of the ACN. And uh, this year, uh, ACN has started a new chapter um, with the EU for Integrity program uh, soon to be launched again, that will focus on um, data-driven, measurable, and consistent assessments uh, based on the performance indicators, as well as the focus of the law enforcement network practitioners on the high-level corruption. So ACN, again, is a regional initiative uh, that uh, includes countries from Estonia to Mongolia, that is shown on the map here. Uh, but EU for Integrity Program usually, obviously uh, includes uh, five Eastern Partnership countries for the monitoring and all six Eastern Partnership countries uh, for the um, peer review and experience exchange programs. Um, the Secretariat is at the WGB, which is Working Group on Bribery, you may have heard of, uh, at the OECD, um, um, and um, it combines around 10 people. Next, please. So with regard to key achievements and challenges in this area, uh, as you can see, um, in fact, just a moment, I need to close my chat in order to be able to see the slides as well. 
and we'll add this. Okay, so the key achievements that was also highlighted by Tina Tin in her presentation were around legal and institutional frameworks, for example, on civil service reform, conflict of interest resolution, and uh, as a declaration. Um, highlighted um, area is also e-governance reforms and civil service delivery. Asset declarations, again, uh, with the publication uh, and um, verification mechanism and uh, certain follow-up in the countries such as, for example, Ukraine, Georgia, and Armenia, um, and uh, e-procurement systems. All of this have resulted in significant impact and decrease of administrative corruption. As regards the challenges that are remaining, they are related to the enforcement of laws um, that have been adopted, of course, and um, specifically the focus on high-level corruption, which is a global challenge, is needed. A judicial and prosecutorial integrity and independence would need to be enhanced in the region. Um, there, there are issues with the monopolization of economy that need to be addressed and uh, mentioned by Tinetin as well, civic space um, and engagement has to be strengthened in the region. Uh, some of the other reforms uh, and all of this in detail is provided in our key publication that is forthcoming, that will be available on our website. And um, a link to this slide is the monitoring report of the ACN that includes detailed information on, on uh, Eastern Partnership countries. Next, please. So this one is the key publication that is forthcoming, and we will have a webinar to, um, to launch it, so you'll, you'll be invited to join it. So zooming in into the specific areas that are relevant for um, Eastern Partnership Policy Framework 20 Deliverables for 2020, as well as the you know, joint communication that was recently adopted, and they are featured also in the OGP commitments. Um, uh, you can see um, some elements of the reforms that have been successful or have been already implemented. But uh, for example, on asset declarations, what is missing is the enforcement of sanctions and the strong follow-up that would result in uh, the investigations or uh, that would uh, respond to the um, civil society complaints regarding the, um, that could be linked to uh, asset declarations that, and require follow-up. Similarly, conflict of interest uh, laws are there, but the enforcement is, is lagging behind. In specialized law enforcement bodies, you, you see the flags of the countries that ha have them, uh, specialization or independence and uh, powers and resources um, have to be strengthened as well. With regard to the beneficial ownership, uh, central register is available only in Ukraine. Uh, there, are, there is some bits of legislation in Armenia as well. Uh, there is no verification and um, enforcement of sanctions as of now. Next, please. So having um, uh, in mind all of these challenges, uh, the ACN new work program uh, has focused uh, its approach on three main pillars uh, to help the countries um, address these challenges as well as uh, to promote anti-corruption reforms. The first um, important pillar that goes well into the measurement uh, that was mentioned by Matthew as well is uh, data-driven and uh, consistent annual monitoring that will be launched by the ACN already this year. They are based on performance indicators. They cover 13 performance areas and um, uh, the monitoring um, envisages involvement of civil society that will be even stronger than before. Uh, the monitoring will be annual and the countries will be uh, engaged in this um, inspiring um, uh, work that will be a, actually a roadmap to a greater performance um, and success. So we will try to use uh, as much as possible our joint work with the OGP and the EU to promote the recommendations and uh, um, as well as suggest that they are included as commitments in the OGP action plans. Mm. 
as well as uh, promoted uh, at the OGP platforms, which uh, uh, includes various stakeholders. Now, with regard to the high level corruption, as mentioned, this is a global challenge, which is a challenge uh, in the region as well, in Eastern Partnership countries. And the, this has been stressed by the Eastern Partnership Policy Framework documents, as well as the OECD work. Um, what is needed is the commitment to address it, as well as capacity of the law enforcement agencies to address uh, high-level corruption and uh, cooperation interagency as well as international to support all this work. The ACN uh, within its law enforcement practitioners network will focus on uh, the high-level corruption through two main tools. First is the studies on high-level corruption. Uh, regional trends and recommendation. And the second one, very, very interesting, is the matrix of high-level corruption cases, which will be a confidential document. However, it will... L uh, allow, uh, thank you. It will allow the civil society to get engaged and provide inputs into the metrics for the future follow-up by the countries. Um, and the third work stream is on business integrity, which is a forum of um, business in, uh, integrity champions, so-called BIG, uh, which will gather annually. Um, and the forum will uh, also look into uh, study on business integrity based on the standardized surveys. And there will be tailored um, training programs also in partnership with the EBRD for uh, for the region. Uh, that was it. In fact, um, next slide just shows our uh, address and all the policy documents and policy papers that have been prepared to address coronavirus. And let me take this last question that was uh, here about the, maybe Jeff, if, if I may, about the coronavirus impact um, uh, and how we adapted our work and what was the policy response. All of this information um, is available on the website, OECD policy response in many areas, including anti-corruption. At the ACN, we conducted a brief survey which showed us uh, that there is already 10 cases related to um, uh, procurement um, in the coronavirus um, uh, pandemic situation, and the analysis based on the survey will be uh, available very shortly. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Thanks very much. Before we move on to Tatevik, uh, our next uh, speaker, we're going to have a second poll now, uh, looking at uh, which anti-corruption commitments you feel are most urgent, most significant uh, in your country. So, yep, the poll is up there. Uh, please fill that in. And uh, I see we're getting actually as many answers as questions we've been getting in the chat, which is which, which is great. Please engage with the poll and uh, we'll carry on. We'll move on to uh, Tatevik uh, Marganian, who is in fact the Independent Reporting Mechanisms researcher in Armenia. Tatevik. Yeah. Hello. Us? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, share with you some insights from Armenia about the current situation and IRM recommendations. Uh, I will start with the current situation, uh, COVID-19, which is a, a problem in Armenia, like in many other countries. And uh, we are uh, now still struggling and have many cases each day. And uh, the first case appeared on March 1st. And uh, in mid-March, the government introduced a state of emergency, which was extended three times already. And uh, there were uh, many restrictions introduced, but uh, some of these restrictions were lifted in May to allow enterprises work. And after lifting restrictions, we have very uh, rapid growth of cases. And uh, currently we have over 21,000 already cases, which is quite high in, for our country of 3 million population. And um, in this situation, we have, uh, in the situation of pandemic, we have uh, quite a number of challenges relevant to the open government. Next slide, please. Um, so um, I would just uh, 
uh, briefly come, come to some of these challenges. Uh, first of all, uh, because of the state of emergency, the government has to restrict some freedoms and uh, rights, like freedom to movement, freedom of assemblies, and uh, some of those restrictions were highly criticized by the civil society. One of them, freedom to ex of expression, that uh, only uh, government sources should be cited uh, for any information about coronavirus. But uh, further these uh, restrictions was uh, lifted and another problematic regulation was um, tracking phone calls and uh, mobile phone locations which was also criticized but was introduced due to this situation uh, access to information is another challenge we have uh, although the government provides daily information about the cases and uh, we're very often conducts prep press briefings on the um, activities on the measures taken, uh, but still CSOs and media emphasize that there is a need for more uh, timely and quality responses to information. And also there is a need for proactive publication of information, especially regarding the spendings and uh, procurements uh, uh, for COVID-19 uh, purposes. Uh, and also uh, a publication of any data that lies behind the decisions made. Um, engagement in decision making is another challenge because of the, the quick decisions that the government has to take and also of limited opportunities for gathering and meetings. Uh, the civil society, uh, the opportunities for participation has uh, significantly shrinked to only online platforms and maybe sometimes statements by CSOs. Uh, so there is a need to maybe to use more online uh, platforms and channels to engage public in decision making. Uh, coming to the OGP action plan, uh, the current action plan was adopted in December uh, 2018 and includes commitments on better disclosure of online information, uh, some participation tools and uh, some of the commitments such as a portal for feedback on public services, uh, various transparency initiatives in the health and education sectors become particularly important in this situation in, in, in the context of open response to pandemic. And also there are some commitments aimed to move services online, like uh, online enlisting for medical services, uh, education, school enrollment, uh, some service, social service information and services provided by community website. So all this commitment also have gained renewed attention uh, because many processes have moved online now. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So the first uh, of our recommendation is to continue and expand the commitments um, uh, that are uh, covering this uh, online uh, participation and access to information opportunities and also to uh, cover uh, uh, open budget commitments like uh, spendings linked to the pandemic. Uh, next uh, recommendation, which was uh, also reflected in the latest IRM report, is about the reforms in health and education sector. Uh, the report has uh, covered some uh, transparency measures for health expenditures and regulations and also suggested to create public monitoring opportunities. And in the current situation, these are uh, up-to-date recommendations also, and um, uh, there is a need for more clear and transparent procedures for monitoring healthcare quality and better disclosure of information on state provided medicine and services and pricing of medical services and in general open informational health expenditures is in high need now because a big portion of the budget goes to the health uh, issues and health institutions and expenses. Uh, as to the education sector, this is also an important and priority, I think, recommendation because uh, in recent months, the education has uh, experienced quite significant challenges in many other countries, I think, as well. Uh, we had the school of education going online and currently universities accept uh, applications online. So this, all the stakeholders have to deal with this new situation and adapting to new technologies and new circumstances. And that, uh, because, uh, though this was a challenge, this is also an opportunity for further activities in this uh, sector because um, uh, like the recommendations that we have in IRM report, ensuring enabling conditions for inclusive education, integrating modern instruction methods through teacher trainings, uh, all these uh, recommendations can be also uh, implemented through online, 
online measures and online tools uh, because now uh, their uh, people are more adapted to online technologies and uh, also the yeah, thanks. Uh, opportunity to use online methods should also be applied not only to education itself, but also to public engagement in this as uh, sector reforms uh, and uh, getting public feedback on the sector, etc. And the last and general recommendations that we have in the IRM report, and it's also important now, it's uh, improved uh, the awareness of the public about the all the tools and platforms that have been produced within OGP action plans. Uh, like uh, the experience shows that there is a little awareness and there is little use by public unless there are large public awareness raising campaign about the platforms. We had this experience with eDraft platform. This is a platform of legal drafts by the government, which has been largely uh, advertised. And recently, uh, e-request platform was advertised during this um, pandemic situation that people can submit their requests and grievances online and uh, the statistics show that there is a significant growth of usage of this platform due to this awareness raising so we recommend to increase visibility of uh, the platforms and tools that have been produced by the government within LGP action plan so this is all thank you very much and uh, i'm i will be happy to answer your questions that's great i see we have some questions coming in and um, but we have the results of the the, the poll which we just had. Let me have a look. I think the yes, there it is. Uh, reforms in judiciary and prosecution services, um, along with corruption investigation and enforcement, seem to be the most uh, followed by I think conflicts of interest. Uh, quite a, a spread, of course, but uh, clearly the judiciary is a challenge across the whole region, and uh, it does tie in with the rule of law focus and monitoring plans of the EU. So um, I think. There's a lot of uh, common thinking in terms of the, the real challenges and priorities. Uh, we'll try to please keep on sending questions. Uh, some people are also answering in the chat. Uh, and in the meantime, it would be great to hear from Diana, Diana Mirza-Glisko, who's the IRM researcher in Moldova. Diana, please. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, in my presentation, I will focus on some country-specific issues of Moldova. I will provide a short overview of the COVID-19 pandemic situation in Moldova and what should be prioritized next in the OGP action plan. So the first COVID case was registered in Moldova on March 7th, so early March, and the government reacted quickly. The state of national emergency was declared in Moldova for a period of 60 days on March 17th. This included a number of restrictions similar to other European countries, very similar to Armenia actually. Since mid-May, a state of health emergency was declared in the country with some restrictions still in place, though many businesses opened their doors. But yesterday it was prolonged until mid-July due to a spike in the number of infections in June. The number of uh, cases to date actually is reaching quickly 15,000, which for Moldova's uh, um, small population between 3.2 uh, 3.6, depends on the sources you read, is quite high. Moldova actually ranks first in Europe for new cases relative to the number of the population and the medical staff infection rate is among the highest in the world, almost a quarter of all infections. And lack of proper protection gear and sporadic testing at the beginning of the pandemic account for this situation. So some specific issues and challenges noted during this period. At the onset of the pandemic, government reacted quickly, working on providing immediate measures to help businesses and citizens. However, civil society and media NGOs in Moldova have criticized the government of how they have handled the crisis. The emergency economic measures law proposed by the government was not approved in the end by the Constitutional Court, as it was deemed unconstitutional due to an attempt to introduce articles which would allow fraud and conflict of interest. The delay of approving the measures raised a bankruptcy risk for many businesses, however. Also, the quarantine rules were applied selectively, so the government held off to launch the Code Red to organize partial parliamentary elections in a constituency in March, despite protests of civil society and uh, the opposition, ending in an entire village put under quarantine. Also, there were disproportionate fines which were applied, as well as very loose enforcement um, of emergency state rules and uh, also preferential treatment. For example, the president going for a walk, posting pictures about it, uh, was not fined, while common citizens jogging by themselves in the park were. Uh, confusing messages uh, conveyed by different state stakeholders, the delayed uh, fights with misinformation and disinformation and limited transparency of COVID-19 related data uh, led to quick spreading of fake news uh, impacting the perception of the population of the state of emergency and the pandemic in general. 
Also, the government is short on cash. Financial aid to citizens and business was delayed. Financial support for medical staff came from businesses and citizens donations. And Moldova asked for international support and aid in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic several times. An important issue is also that society is heavily counting on remittances, which are in decline at the moment. So what priorities lie ahead? And considering the COVID-19 pandemic, what should be prioritized next in the OGP action plans? Um, if we could go to the to the next uh, slides. So uh, first of all, uh, continuing to improve the transparency of public procurement through the e-procurement system, currently mTender, which was already launched in uh, 2018, though not all functionalities are developed or function properly. And as Victor already mentioned, uh, this might change. And um, it is important to mention that the country should consider upscaling the commitment. Even before the pandemic unfolded, uh, one of the IRM recommendations in the most recent uh, report was for the health sector procurement transparency to be addressed in future action plans. This become even more, becomes even more important uh, as the pandemic has shown that challenges with health sector procurement during the pandemic lead to a higher risk of corruption. As for example, the pandemic driven crisis coincided with the disinfectants crisis. So centralized tender for disinfectants for hospitals was launched in December 19, but finalized in March 2020. And hospitals uh, uh, on the onset of the pandemic were forced to find disinfectants on the local market or otherwise, leaving a lot of medical staff vulnerable. The crisis built up also after a decision of the government government uh, to include disinfectants on the list of social goods um, was approved in February 2020, and this has disincentivized the imports of disinfectants. So the lack of protection gear, insufficient quality of the gear, lack of precise data on medical supply stocks are among other issues as well. Secondly, protection of civic space and access to information, an area which still needs a lot of improvement. During the pandemic, the issues with access to information have surfaced even more. There were attempts to, of the government to conceal the real situation in Moldova. Uh, there were poor communications, restricted information, me media censorship, and lack of precise data um, on the current crisis and attempt to uh, media censorship. So Moldova should include commitments to better protect civil space and ensure a fair and open operating environment for civil society and journalists and more detailed recommendations we have also included in the most recent IRM report. And thirdly, and the last point is that the focus on education, as we have seen uh, during the pandemic, becomes crucial. And uh, there were uh, education commitments included in previous action plans, but they were mainly, mainly linked to opening data and developing the platforms, as Tina mentioned in her presentation. However, the situation during the pandemic showed that there is a variety of issues which could be addressed and moving the educational process online showed that there was a limited ICT support for teachers concerning the challenges of online teaching, cybersecurity, as well as limitations linked to, to the infrastructure. So especially teachers, students and parents from rural areas are impacted by the situation. So future action plans should consider more specific commitments on how to address the lack of information and knowledge of these stakeholders and uh, uh, create opportunities for more public engagement, for example, for parents in this sector. So um, this is all that I had for you and uh, I'm open for more questions and more details if there are any. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Diana. That's great. We, we, we have a, some space now for some, some, some questions. So if anybody actually would like to uh, even speak, please raise your hand uh, in the in the chat, uh, we can take that. We do have some questions. So what I'll do is maybe go through the, the speakers. Certainly there's a question uh, for uh, Mr. Boske from, uh, uh, which is about the level of inclusion uh, in terms of engagement, uh, open contracting. Have you seen uh, COVID with COVID-19, the needs for gender disaggregated data and other targeted in interventions? And maybe also we can hear from Victor on that in terms of equity and procurement. Uh, there's also a question from Andreas Pavlo from OGP on the challenges related to the use of non-competitive procedures in several countries. What are the direct recommendations there? So maybe we can uh, go to the, the, the panelists. If you could start with uh, Matthew Wolske, if you're still with us, if you could uh, respond. Are you with us? If not, we'll come back to you. Vic Victor, uh, are, are you able to unmute? Yes. Brilliant. Yes, I'm here and happy to talk 
about that. So actually, as I, as I mentioned in the chat, we've just launched a joint project with support from the Open Society Foundation, where we're trying to look at uh, COVID expenditures linked to um, uh, basically equity, equity uh, criteria. And we are now developing the methodology and designing the tool how to actually collect uh, the data from different kinds of procurement system to link them with different uh, criteria and do a comp comprehensive research of how actually this uh, money are spent, uh, how they uh, you know, consider inclusiveness and so on and so forth. Uh, so we will keep you updated on that. And again, as I mentioned, in July, we are going to present our gender research uh, where we looked at you know, barriers for uh, participation of women-led business and how we can uh, fix the situation. So follow us on social media or send me a direct message and we will inform you when we are going to present it. Brilliant, thanks. And uh, I think we've lost uh, Mathieu, but uh, uh, Jasmina, would you like to, to come back on, on, on some of those issues? Which ones in specific would you like me to comment on? Particularly on the civic engagement and whether with COVID-19 you've seen enough civic engagement. It doesn't have to, not just in OGP, but, but generally. And is there perhaps enough space for citizen monitoring? Absolutely. We have on one hand public across different countries that is so determined, so willing to, to help especially we're seeing large numbers of, of volunteers who are signing up for various uh, food delivery services and etc. People are very, very, very keen to share and to do, uh, do their best. They're very clear this is a problem that is not just government's responsibility. It's, we all need to come together to address it. But at the same time, what we are seeing is there's very little invitation and open opportunities on behalf of governments to say, well, help us out with, by doing this or that. So what we do know is that uh, as governments are desperately trying to kickstart the economy, they're allowing building sites, for example, to reopen. What we do know is we are not saying let's send citizens to stand next to builders and see what is happening and etc. cetera. But, but why not engage builders to say, are things happening as, as, as they should be. They're, they can act in their private capacity and professional capacity. They can provide independent feedback. What we do know, um, I, I would just like to see more such opportunities. We are mainly seeing um, civil society sector to open these opportunities for citizens and the strong bond of trust is being created and that has been noted by various different quick researches that uh, we're seeing in a couple of, um, couple of months. But what I would really like to see is focused um, possibilities being opened in that public um, service, delivery of public services space. And there are lots of creative ways we, we can do this. Great. And Rusudan, did you want to come back, particularly on civil society engagement? Yes, thank you, Jeff. In fact, um, for the future work that I announced uh, for the monitoring of implementation of anti-corruption reforms based on performance indicators, uh, civil society could voice uh, the concerns of uh, society at large uh, in this process um, and add to the government responses um, that we have in the monitoring through answering um, questionnaire, which is the shadow report actually from civil society uh, that we regularly receive. Uh, so this will be annual um, for the OECD and we're, we also invite civil society at our plenary meetings where we discuss in detail the monitoring reports, including recommendations. So there is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to shape some of the future recommendations and possibly OGP commitments with that. Great. Um, I just wanted to, before we, we go to the next session, perhaps um, uh, Tatavik and Diana could give your kind of reaction to, to the poll that the judiciary uh, judiciary and prosecution come kind of considered the, the, the top challenges. 
does that uh, mirror your reflections in the case of Armenia and Moldova? And also, do you feel it's reflected enough in the in the likely action plan commitments, or is it something where there needs to be more mobilization of of, of, uh, of prioritization that the judiciary and prosecution services are top priority? Because they're rather big issues in both countries. Uh, would you like to go first? Yes, actually, this is one of the issues that we highlighted in the priorities of IRM recommendations. And this issue is very largely discussed after the revolution within the two years, and still there is no real uh, tangible solution found, I think. So uh, I, I really share this uh, concern that uh, we had in the poll, and uh, I hope that in the next action plan there will be some uh, commitments regarding the judiciary. So this is an ongoing process, and there were, have been some legislation and policies, uh, like uh, there was uh, in in end of 2019, the government has uh, adopted a strategy on judicial reforms, uh, but still, I think there is a need to uh, more pub for more public engagement and transparency in this aspect. So, I would uh, really uh, recommend and uh, expect that uh, this issue will be reflected in the next action plan. And maybe the, there will be an uh, uh, the, the, it will be great if OGP could also. Uh, provide some assistance regarding open judiciary uh, commitments in general, like uh, maybe it, it will be helpful for the government to find out the right uh, design of the commitment. Thank you. This, this, might, this might be one of the areas for, for, for regional cooperation, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, D D D Diana, in the case of uh, Moldova, this again yes, is around the same topical issue. Yeah. I echo what Tatevik just said, especially with the last recommendation that and what you just said, Jeff, that maybe it could be uh, an opportunity for some regional support in this area. Indeed, in the most recent IRM report for Moldova, um, there is also a recommendation um, to consider including commitments in the future aimed at increasing the transparency and independence of the justice system. And um, yes, Moldova also elaborated several um, uh, documents and there is a justice system reform strategy uh, that was elaborated uh, already back in 2010-2011 um, and then a new one developed for 2019-2022. And uh, there were uh, some commitments uh, or milestones on that uh, included in the fourth action plan uh, activities, for example, is the improvement of access to justice uh, by extending the network of paralegals. Uh, however, uh, definitely there is uh, a lot of work to be done in this area. So maybe future commitments could indeed uh, focus on, uh, on this area, especially on the transparency of the uh, selection of uh, judges, promotion, uh, dismissal procedures, and other more detailed recommendations we provide in the report, and uh, access to justice. Uh, um, this is also a very um, important area which might be considered as well in the new uh, plan. Yeah, I mean, it seems there's definitely the, the challenge of the independence of the judiciary versus the question of are they, have the judiciary really been vetted? And I think this is, this is a challenge in both cases, as we've seen obviously in, in, in Armenia, also the whole battle between Prime Minister Pashinyan and the Constitutional Court. So there's, it's such a challenging issue, just, just as also to bring in civic engagement, civil society. Does that uh, challenge the independence? Should it be just the judges, but then are the judges already uh, uh, independent? It, it, it's a kind of uh, round and round in circles. And it's something where I think uh, lessons can also be learned from the EU. We're seeing challenges in, in Poland, for instance. It's not just an Eastern Partnership issue. And this is where perhaps with the going forward, there could be more kind of interconnections between challenges, approaches in the Eastern Partnership and the EU, because some, some countries in the EU have got very relevant experience. Others are actually going through a, a new cycle where there are challenges to democracy. What I want to do now is to, to bring in Georgi uh, Kiliashvili, who's uh, from the IDFI in uh, uh, Georgia, but also has been on the OGP steering committee member uh, to talk about regional commitment. And uh, we're gonna have a, a, another open-ended poll, which I think we could perhaps launch straight after Gyorgi's contribution. Gyorgi. Hi, Jeff. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, am I heard well? Yes, that's great. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I think I'm the last presenter, so 
I will keep myself short, but I cannot start without thanking the OGP Support Unit for organizing this webinar. It's a unique opportunity to see the familiar faces and my colleagues uh, from the globe, uh, especially during this COVID crisis or the post-crisis times. And I'm really grateful to all of you for being here and and my uh, uh, fellow colleagues who presented uh, before, and it was very interesting listening to you. Actually, a lot has been touched and covered uh, uh, during the presentations, uh, and I think there is not much uh, left for me to speak about, but uh, yes, there are things that uh, I really would like to share with you about the cross-cutting cooperation in the Eastern Partnership countries especially um, about the topics that OGP is actively working on. Um, the COVID uh, crisis actually set an environment where there are um, increasing challenges of corruption, especially in the countries of Eastern Partnership, because we are the state that uh, uh, are dependent on the international aid and su support. And for, for instance, Georgia will be receiving up to three billion uh, in, in, in support to, to come out from the COVID crisis. And this, uh, of course, uh, of course, create the situation where the uh, corruption risks are really increasing. Therefore, uh, different activities, uh, especially the cross-country cross cross-cutting cooperation will be really important. And this is why the OGP itself was created and the whole idea of OGP is the cooperation between the states and some kind of the competition in moving forward the uh, reforms in, in the direction of good governance, fighting corruption, etc. So I think that the environment currently is really, uh, really challenging and what we can see from the previous and uh, what, what we heard from the previous presentations uh, in uh, Armenia, in Moldova, in Ukraine, in Georgia, actually we have this situation when we have to overcome this crisis by more participation, more active monitoring and oversight from, from civil society organizations. And um, there are the areas that the countries could quite well share their, uh, their experience in combating corruption, uh, in various fields, including EITI, Extractive Transparency, extra, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, or opening public registries that Armenia and Ukraine are really championing now, or uh, public procurement that also Ukraine is really good in and can share share this experience with the uh, with the uh, region on, on the regional level as as well as on the international one and uh, of course the role of um, parliaments and legislative openness in the times of co post active crisis of uh, covid-19 will be really important because parliaments are really should be really providing the proper oversight of the government's work. And uh, uh, openness and especially the proactive openness of info public information by government institution is something that uh, I think we should be uh, more, more focused on and uh, really push forward the governments to be uh, enhancing in, uh, in, in providing information to citizens to have a better uh, opportunity, a better opportunity to provide the uh, oversight of government works. And in this regards, actually, uh, Rusudan spoke about the EU for integrity action for the Eastern Partnership program that EU is, uh, is uh, currently supporting the countries and is providing assistance to Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, and Republic of Moldova and Ukraine to prevent and combat threats to the rule of law, to support justice sector and public administration in four in line with the Eastern Partnership 20 deliverables of 2020. So I think this is a very unique opportunity for the cross-cutting programs. And uh, 
I think that uh, that the countries, including the civil society organizations, should be using this platform and opportunity to strengthen its uh, role in, uh, in in improving the rule of law and other sectors, including the fighting corruption. So, um, as uh, as it was mentioned, it will be very closely cooperating with the Open Government Partnership and OSCD uh, in, in working on these directions. And I really encourage you to focus on this program and use this opportunity to to improve your, your, your work in these directions. Another, uh, uh, another platform that I would like to share with you is the transparent public procurement rating that started uh, a couple of years ago with the support of the Open Society Foundation. And uh, the idea behind it was to measure the level, uh, the existing legislation of public procurement uh, in Eastern Partnership countries. Currently, this uh, platform is really uh, increased and we are covering the, uh, we are working currently with the 50 countries across the globe and uh, we have very significant outcomes as, a, as in minute, procurement in several other countries. So um, I will be happy to, uh, to you know, like uh, expand like more, more about these topics by question and answers because I don't have much time to speak, but uh, I really, I really hope that the uh, Eastern Partnership region will be a very important platform in moving forward the reforms and uh, sharing a good practice with with other countries in the frames of the Open Government Partnership. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Georgi. Uh, we we don't have a poll, but what we do we want to do is to have. A question, basically, if you could all give your feedback in, in chat, which is, are there areas for regional cooperation or possibly coordinated commitments? So please uh, put in, in the chat your answers. And I wanted to go back to uh, Mathieu Bosquet from the DG, DG NIR, but on, on citizens' engagement in COVID-19, and also to get uh, uh, your feedback on, on the judiciary question. Mathieu. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think on COVID-19, I mean, we, we we need to think about the post-COVID-19. I mean, steel limit is very relevant in the region, but we need to think about the post-COVID-19. I mean, the, the threats to uh, uh, rule of law it poses, but also, I mean, the new ways of working and uh, uh, the hybrid mechanisms. And I mean, I have to say I'm very much amazed by the meeting we're having today. I mean, with such a, a level of um, using the digital uh, really to exchange experience and the reactivity. But I think we need to continue and we need to build on that. Now on the justice, I think the justice reforms are the most difficult ones. I mean, in EU member states and in Eastern partnership countries, that's very evident. Uh, we've seen that very clearly. We've been strongly associated in the policy dialogue on justice reform in almost all countries, at least where there was some opening that we could discuss on. Uh, and we can see the difficulty of that. And this is where what we decided is to work also on the metrics in the justice. So we are going to get a program with the Council of Europe where we are going to make a little bit what we do in Europe, which is a, a justice uh, a dashboard and to have it in the Eastern Partnership countries. This is a program which is in preparation. So a little bit like OECD anti-corruption network, we do having performance indicators in the anti-corruption sphere. Uh, we will have it in the justice sector with some kind of information uh, provided, which will feed to you in order also to bring some reaction and some uh, uh, comments that we can make and, and, and pressure on, on the government. So that's very important. In addition, I think Rosudan can confirm that we have agreed that in the OECD uh, anti-corruption network, I mean, we will look specifically at the judicial uh, sector as part of uh, uh, where uh, uh, anti-corruption uh, uh, measures, I mean, can be taken. So certainly, I mean, this is uh, um, maybe the most challenging and where we really need, I mean, to work together and really to get a, a strong engagement from all partners uh, in terms of pushing the reforms, which are challenging, but which everybody experience uh, at the end of the day, because a fair justice system, efficient, accountable, I mean, is absolutely essential, I mean, for a, a good functioning of a, of, a, of a country, I would say of a democracy, but of a country at least. Thank you. That's great. And I just wanted to come back to, to Georgi. Um, 
Georgi, do, do you feel that there's a um, particular scope for regional cooperation in, in, in these areas, in the judiciary? Do you, do you think, or for other actors, where, 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 where do you feel there's the most scope, given, given the common challenges in the region? Georgi, are you still with us? Yes, I'm, I'm Brilliant. Uh, well, yes, judiciary is a really uh, important area that really needs to be improved in the Eastern Partnership countries. Uh, it is uh, the part of the rule of law, and uh, there are significant challenges uh, in this area, and the EU support as well as the support from other donor community is really, uh, really forwarded to this direction. So cooperation uh, between, uh, between the states on this area is really important. Another area I also would uh, consider the um, legislative branch as uh, uh, in the frames of OGP, we have the parliaments actively involved and the role of parliaments in OGP is really increasing. So uh, especially as I, as, I, as, I, uh, as I mentioned earlier that uh, after the COVID crisis, the um, huge amounts of money will be spent by the international donors as well as the uh, from the budget of the states and uh, the more active monitoring from civil civil society will be needed and as well as the parliaments who will be oversighting the work of the government in these directions by uh, on, on the different programs so the role of parliaments will be really also important uh, and uh, legislative openness in, in, in these regards Thanks very much, Gilgi. We're, we're, we're almost out of time, but I just want to thank everybody for the great resources that have been shared in the chat. And I think we'll find a way of perhaps sharing that with everybody later. Uh, I don't know if we can perhaps share the presentation. Yes, yeah, so the, 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 the links will be registration links shared for the European webinar, which is coming up. Uh, also, the details of the OGP local call for expression, I see, are there in the chat. So I think... Uh, a brilliant resource um, in terms of the chat. So many links there. That's incredibly helpful. Uh, so thank you to everybody from the support unit, all the speakers, panelists. It's been uh, a very, very uh, rich and fruitful uh, webinar. I'm glad to see we had a, a large number of participants, uh, 56 even now. So that's brilliant. Thanks very much. Goodbye, everybody.